then um, welcome to the, uh, the engineering steering committee. What we usually do is meet once a week um, virtually and uh, there's typically more of us but the rest try to hide today, don't know. Um, and yeah, just uh, go through our weekly schedule, which is very rigid so that everybody who's supposed to speak up at some point knows when to wake up and, and do their part. Um, and where we discuss all the, all the matter that um, comes up during the week, how to, how to proceed and, and, and we, I think we never need to, we, we always uh, agree in the end on, on what we want to do and whoever wants to do something does something and that works out all pretty well and we're all very friendly people. Um, so whenever you have some, some technical issue around LibreOffice um, that you think is best solved, uh, not by yourself in your small little chamber, but by reaching out, then do come to these weekly meetings. We're always open to visitors, to guests, and uh, yeah, present your issues. But today, we'll do it completely differently and not have any fixed schedule, but um, are waiting for your input and your questions to hopefully give you some, some answers. So if any of these experts sitting here um, might know something that you always wanted to know about spoons or software or whatever. Uh, my first question is more like a usual ESC committee session uh, in, in line with it. Uh, there was a recent uh, security a problem recently uh, and uh, it was uh, fixed for the next uh, versions uh, of LibreOffice. Are there uh, plans to create out of schedule uh, fast uh, release? Yes, indeed, there is a plan to create an out of schedule release for the 7.5 line and also to shorten the one for the upcoming 7.6.2 to just a 1RC candidate. And uh, both will be tagged uh, this week and we are planning to have a release ready for Tuesday. Great, thanks. Next question. Leo. <laughs> Anything. Anything. <laughs> okay, let's go try. Yeah. Don't manage. Well, um, in Calc, oops, in Calc, I'm uh, keeping account of my uh, bank accounts, and it is a rather huge uh, data set, and it is rather private. Uh, but it is very slow because I use a lot of search functions and I'm now wondering how can I uh, pass on the data without give, uh, giving free my personal data. So one way or the other I'm, I'm sh to try and anonymize the data but still have all the formula there in order to that Maybe my computer is too slow, that could be a, could be a reason, but if, if I look at the uh, system uh, monitor, I see that it, it's running at 100%, well, although I have four processors, they keep on jumping to, to 100%. So, it's, in fact, it's a general question, but how to anonymize my data and how to try and reduce the amount of uh, processor time. Is that the question that is valid for to be asked here? <laughs> Thank you for the perfect question. That was even two questions in one. So one is uh, about calc performance. I don't think we have any... There's no Ica around, that's the problem. So he might know. Or is anybody... 
part of the question is kind of a, maybe a QA question. That exactly, that's, uh, that's part two. So about the, so um, no help with, the, with the getting it faster done, but uh, at least with the anonymization, maybe Cisco. Yeah, so regarding the anonymization of data. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's actually related to the other question as well, because once you, you can get the document anonymized, then you can create a report and maybe someone from the core developers can take a look at it. And yeah, regarding how to anonymize the data, well, my first approach would be to using calc, try to use replace, um, like you can use um, regular expressions, so you can uh, repl replace everything by a single character like X and if it works then everything is well, it's great otherwise I don't know if um, I would try to um, try to remove parts of the document as long as the problem is still reproducible so in the end you just have a minimize document then it still triggers the problem and then when you already have something minimal then it's much easier so to anonymize this document that would be the two approaches that come to mind uh, but maybe others have uh, other ideas Yeah, I mean, even uh, especially for calc, it might be um, because what, what you need there to reproduce something is the, the, the formulas probably and the amount of data, but not the exact data. So if you have some issue in writer, maybe it's more difficult to reduce that uh, to obscure your love letters and not send them around. Um, but for, for calc, it, it sounds like maybe we could uh, try to do an extension um, that automatically replaces whatever numbers with random numbers and whatever text with the random text or something like that sounds like that could be a useful. So uh, if you want to get into uh, extension development, we have a whole website and wiki and whatnot where you can start to, to implement that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for doing that. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, random numbers would be great there because um, trying to reduce your problem and, and still see that it runs slow might be, yeah, it would be great for the, for the QA and for the developers if you do that up front, but it can be very tedious, I guess, so um, nobody would, would actually do that probably. Uh, depending on the kind of that data and the kind of operation that you are doing, you may evaluate the possibility of using array formulas. In array formulas, which is one formula for a big set of data, and uh, it may be faster. It's a matter of testing. Okay. There's a hidden calc expert here. <laughs> Yeah, I already work on high performance computing, so we have to tweak the data so that it can be processed faster. And yeah, I have a question. Um, is it this document uh, something that used to work uh, properly in the past and is not working? Uh, it's slow or uh, triggering a performance issue nowadays with our recent. Um, uh, patient, because if it's that the case, maybe, I mean, because we are here in person, maybe we can take a look and uh, don't publish it somewhere, like anywhere in the in the vaccine, but at least we could, um, you yeah, know, like take a look together and maybe see if we can know where, when was it introduced and from there we can uh, move on. I started with it uh, something like 
three years ago. And as uh, most things, you are happy with what you get, and then you see new opportunities. So you keep on increasing, adding formulas, adding new functionalities. Uh, so I'm now, I think, at version 14, uh, which means every time I improve it, I make a new version to it. But I see it also when I started with version 2 or version 1. Okay, I didn't have that much data, but I didn't have that much functionality either. So it has been an ongoing process. And yeah, that added to yeah, the processing time and to the complexity of the, of the, of the spreadsheet. Okay, thanks again. Um, there's a question up here. Works like a charm. Thank you, and uh, it's good to see you all in a <laughs> row. Um, I have a question regarding uh, official uh, documents that you as a committee are responsible for, or policy documents or whatever that can say something in regards to uh, uh, the recommendation of, of, of ODF as, as the default format for, for uh, recommendations to, to users. Uh, uh, is that something you can elaborate a bit on? Thank you. Yep, thank you. Is anybody of you eager to answer? No. Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess this is more of a yeah, maybe even more of a marketing issue than, than a technical issue. So what we, or, or a political issue maybe, where we are very eager not to <laughs> get drawn into anything for, for a reason, uh, and which uh, kind of worked, worked well for us for more than 10 years by now. Um, so what we concentrate on is, is really, um, there's an issue with a code or with a CI pipeline or um, with anything uh, really technical, um, not with um, how does a feature appear to the end user. We're more concerned with how is a feature implemented. Does that bring any issues if we want to implement another feature? Does that interfere maybe in a way that, that is, that is uh, non-optimal? Um, but we, I think we never decided on anything uh, um, in, in any way visual or, or um, apparent to, to the end user, but just to the underlying things. Even uh, the, the, the version numbers, we defer them uh, to the marketing team to tell us that the next version will not be 7.8, but uh, 24.2 is the next one. So I'm afraid you better pick, um, maybe Italo would be the go-to guy for questions like that. Well, thank you. Anything else? Heiko, your, your chance to get a question in from the other side that you're not sitting down here, so it's your turn now. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> you kidding me? <laughs> you asked me rather why I'm not sitting over there. <laughs> And it didn't want me to answer it. I do. <laughs> no, I don't have a question to the ESC. Um, I just opened my notebook because uh, do we have um, maybe a Jitsi or some streaming? Maybe the audience is um, giving some input via stream. I don't know. Mike, do we have anything from the outside world? <laughs> the... <laughs> no. Well, the people here are sitting together anyway, and I wonder if we have, for example, a Jitsi stream to somewhere in the world, and people are uh, listening to us. Do they have questions? They could. Maybe. People can send questions into the, into the chat. I'll take a look now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and we'll just hold on for a second and wait for the outside world questions. Yet. Oh. But people can ask questions. 
Come on, people around the world. Where's your questions? Uh, maybe just a simple point uh, to the question regarding uh, recommendations, official documents and the like. And we have the uh, LibreOffice migration protocol, more or less. And this touches up on open document as a format that represents open standards. So maybe this is a starting point to expand upon. Uh, and it came to the file format as well. I think one of the things that do, did come to the steering committee at one point was when the idea of changing the default version of which version of uh, ODF were we going to save by default. That would have come to the engineering steering committee that the idea was we should now save the whatever it was, 1.3. Is everybody okay with that? Does anybody see any downsides? Have a discussion about it that the oldest supported version of LibreOffice out there would be able to import it in maybe two or three versions before that, so we all kind of knew what kind of impact it would have. So that kind of thing does happen, does come to the EAC, and there is some thought about it, but uh, that's about the limit of it that I've seen so far. Obviously, if somebody had two competing implementations of something, that's the kind of thing that would uh, be put to the ESC as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Um, new guests, new questions. Yes, hi, it's Stefan from the team. Um, I don't know very much about the ESC, but I um, wanted to know how is generated the input you discuss inside the ESC? Where does it come from? Is it the personal input you bring in uh, where you are focused on to work? Come it from the companies um, you are working for, so it's just so, for me an interesting question where this input comes from. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody wants to pick up spontaneously? Yeah, me. Oh. <laughs> I should. <laughs> um, it is. It depends. Um, me, I get a lot of uh, input from users, requests to enhancement or issues, and I pick those that um, might be of interest for developers in the hope someone is interested. I believe the ESC notes gets a lot of attraction. People read it, and or at least skim through it. I see comments on the mailing list uh, later on for, let's say, uh, some. Uh, compiler change and, and whatever. One example that I, um, I looked through, an example what I do typically, uh, it is a request that we got uh, this week and it is about mixed um, addresses in calc. You can typically say, um, give me the sum from A1 to B2 or give me the result from all the column A. Mixed means from A1 to B. And this feature exists in Google Sheets, and the user asks, why not in Calc? So I was wondering, is it defined by ODF? And it's kind of uh, connected to the question before. Um, I looked through the uh, description, and it reads to me as if it is possible. It is not implemented. You cannot do it. And when you export uh, the document in G Sheet, then you get something replaced. It is uh, A1 to C3, or not. Shall we do an enhancement? I involved uh, our experts, Eike, and he said, no, it's not defined. He found another place in the um, ODF description or the reference where the opposite is stated. It has to be row, colon, column, or row, colon, row, period, nothing else. And the point is, at this um, point in discussion, where do we have to do the uh, change? Probably the, um, the standard needs to be more clear on what is possible. That's currently the outcome, but that's what I do. I flag the question during the call. No one can answer, of course not, but it gets hopefully more attention. 
does that typically work out or do you um, <laughs> follow up on how, how many of the devs uh, respond to your tickets? <laughs> You're often uh, receive a deafening silence in the course, so I'm a, bit, uh, <laughs> I'm a bit sorry for you at times. Unfortunately, I do not get more uh, time from volunteers. No. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> sad part. Um, so yeah, coming back to that question of where do we get the input from? Um, of course, everybody who regularly sits in on, on, on the ESC um, have their own set of, of questions that they bring. Um, but another um, recurring pattern is that um, maybe on, so we, we usually uh, meet on, on uh, Thursday uh, afternoon uh, European time and, and what often happens is that during the week of, uh, on, on IRC developer channel there is something coming up um, and um, some interesting question that somebody has who is not usually um, going to the ESC and then somebody uh, steps in and says yeah that's something that we should actually discuss there and, and, and uh, then takes on the job of bringing that in and uh, having a quick discussion and a consensus then on, on whatever topic arises there. It's often about, or uh, another thing that we um, try to, to encourage people if they have any incompatible changes so that they would break anything uh, for the user or for the external developers, um, then that they should bring that into the ESC to discuss it there, whether that's something that we can change because the chances of, of breaking people's external code is low or whether that's something where somebody who's an expert in that field says, oh no, everybody's using that, hands off please. Um, and then there's usually somebody who is uh, kind of proxying in for, for whoever has that uh, issue and, and uh, discuss it in the, in the EC calls. I uh, just want to add something to uh, the question of Stefan. We have this uh, weekly meeting of the ESC. It's a rather classical project management meeting where each of the individuals uh, presents the results of what they are doing. Uh, we have uh, information brought by uh, uh, release engineering, documentation, uh, quality assurance, uh, crash testing, and uh, all this information is put in common on these meetings. And uh, um, comments are welcome if by any chance someone wants to make a comment on, uh, on the topics that are being reported. So it's quite a very tight um, management of the project and very professional. And uh, also to mention that the ESC uh, meetings are not a closed group, so everyone is free to attend and bring up uh, their own topics. Ideally, uh, when the minutes are created, so people can have an idea, prepare, whatever. And yeah, but to make it true, it's not about your personal issue that needs fixing, so not for this general stuff. So this is pre-filtered by UX and QA, more or less. and. But yeah, you're free to attend, so nobody will kick you out, and you're welcome to, to give your own input. Yeah, oh. Uh, no, I suppose just to fill in as well, I think one of the questions was uh, the input from companies. I think there's a regular slot about what people are working on, and I guess one of the main, one of the purposes of the ESC is to just flag in advance that you are working on something that's going to be potentially uh, disruptive uh, to make sure people are aware of it so that you don't wake up some morning and everything has changed without there being some forewarning so you know you, you, you had a regular uh, uh, feedback that there was going to be changes to the um, uh, uh, the gradient work that we see now the multi-step gradient and there's about four or five talks on gradients in this uh, conference here so that was flagged well before it landed that there was going to be changes to gradients and to get some idea of what kind of changes there would be in case anybody had any objections or maybe maybe more importantly in case there were two or three different people working on gradients at the same time in three different ways to make sure that you know uh, that didn't happen and then the other thing is to let other groups know um, that you're working on something so 
if you're working on something and you're asking, letting people know in advance that there's going to be a lot of translation changes required for this. I say if it's going to be a feature that lands just before the usual translation freeze, let people know that there's going to be a huge number of translations and maybe you say, okay, that's too many translations to land just at the end. Why don't you put the translations in now, even though you don't have the feature available, let them translate it and then you can get the feature in at the very end and the translations are available and that kind of um, coordination is, is, is helpful to, uh, you see, helps do that kind of coordination. Yeah, and another interesting uh, piece might also be that, yes, we always have a, an agenda um, that we create up from uh, Miklos, who is, I don't know why he's not around this year. Um, he's always the one, or thankfully the one, who, who prepares that every week and typically sends it out on Wednesdays to the developer list and the QA list, I think at least. Um, and if you have any topics, then it's great if you just uh, send a reply to that maybe so that we have an idea that there's more coming and we can uh, allocate some time or, or uh, prepare even for there will be some, some more questions coming in. Okay, thank you. Nearly at the end. Sorry? We're nearly at the end. Uh, I think we have a full hour. Do we? Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> we, we tried hard, it didn't work out. Or um, <laughs> are we at the end of the full hour already? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so any more questions? Any last questions? We're running out of time. <laughs> so another thing we usually have in these meetings uh, in, in the regular schedule is that we have this uh, what's cooking section um, which is maybe the most interesting part also for the outsiders because that's where um, if somebody is working on something shiny, big, new, interesting, potentially disruptive or um, just large enough to, to let everybody else know that there's something coming um, then they um, inform the rest of the, of the uh, meeting about that in this uh, what's cooking section. Um, one thing we obviously missed, for example, is what uh, Marina presented earlier today on this outreachy project where they um, are going to, to replace um, the Windows installer uh, construction of, of what uh, then ends up as the, as the installer, which is, a, I think, a very great project um, because the code we have there is um, very, very old, written by somebody. Um, he's no longer with the project, so we can, we can uh, confess that he had no idea about Perl, uh, but wrote a, a million line of Perl, maybe, and we're stuck with that now. Um, and we will be very, very, very happy uh, if we eventually get rid of that. And I think this is a project that kind of went under our radar for, for, for uh, the most part of the last three months, I think, the, the time this outreachy project ran. Um, and that's something we, we should uh, pick up on and, and see how to, to move that forward. For example, by... Um, so that's a now an optional way of building it. So we have the old way still because the new way is not working probably or uh, fully functional, function complete yet. So we have a, a switch whether to use the old or the new and we should set up one of the CI boxes probably to, to always uh, test the new way so that it doesn't, doesn't break again and then see how to move forward with that. So what I wanted to come back to is uh, um, our what's cooking section of anybody Oh, there's a question. What am I talking? <laughs> I'm coming to the question. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it's an ESC question, but uh, in the ESC uh, minutes, there is always those uh, reports of uh, failing uh, tests. And those are failed a lot. And I was wondering, is there a way to come back to, to go from, uh, to find all the instances where one test failed. Like, for example, I know I had this uh, 
uh, VCC, uh, accessibility uh, GCK for VCL that, that sometimes fails enough to appear here. But is there a way for me to look at all the failings so I could see why they are failing? Uh, yes, uh, but it's a little convoluted. So you can search in, in Garrett for the uh, failure uh, category, and then you see all the the change sets that failed with this error. And then you have to take a good guess which one is the first one or which one is the most interesting one. And uh, as you mentioned, with most of these failures, those are not uh, persistent failures. So they happen occasionally. And this is what makes it hard to track down really the, the importance of a specific one, because uh, one failure can happen in just one change that, that has 10 different revisions of a patch until the problem was fixed. So uh, those kind of uh, reasons are also not reflected in this simple stats. Those are just uh, blindly counting all the failures that happened during the last week. and and not uh, doing any further analysis on how widespread uh, those were in terms of different people affected. And also there can be the case that a, uh, a series of patches is based on top of each other. So if one of the first ones has an actual error that causes the test to fail, all the other ones that have this uh, specific uh, commit as a parent will also fail, even if those changes uh, themselves wouldn't cause the failure. So it can be used as a trend and indicator for your own builds. If you see this error, then you can assume it is a flaky test and you can resume the build and expect the, the next build to pass. So this is the primary use of this list, so to speak. But yeah, you can look in Garrett itself uh, for the changes that failed. Unfortunately, it's not possible in, in, in Jenkins on CI the system, uh, there you cannot search for it, but you can do the search using Garrett and go to the old build logs from there. Yes, so the question was, you can look for the failing test as it appears in the ESC method logs. So it's not limited to one specific test, but rather the make file uh, target that runs the tests. But yeah, those terms that appear in the ESC minutes, you can search for in, in Garrett. And, and that works because um, Jenkins uh, writes that Garrett, that command into Garrett, and we search through the commands. Oh, okay, yeah. Even something I learned. <laughs> A subsequent question is for how long the, the like the Jenkins results are kept for. Like if I'm looking for a chain or for a, res, a build uh, log from last year, will I find it? Okay. Repeat, please. Yeah, I repeat it for the recording. Uh, so the uh, failing logs are kept for at least one year. I think we don't even limit it currently. So, but, but yeah, at least one year for the failing logs. Uh, but the successful logs get uh, truncated, and the build results themselves still are available. So you can see that the platform uh, succeeded in building, but the, uh, the the log will be empty for those. But the failing logs are kept in full. Thanks. Next question. Anybody? You have a question, that's great. Yeah, I'll ask the question just so we get it uh, recorded what the answer is. There's a little reoccurring section where we have um, kind of highlighted bugs from QA which are most in need of looking at. How do you pick the most how do you pick the bugs that you list there? What's the criteria for appearing in that list? You mean the 
the highest. Okay, so basically, I check every week um, when a bug in Baxilla has been changed the priority to highest. Then, if that's done, uh, I just bring it to the ESC. Is it that the question or why it's changed to highest? Yeah. And the same for there is another uh, part after that one, which is high severity back of the weeks. So it's the same logic. So when a back during the week from previous ESC meeting to this the current ESC meeting is changed to, to high, then it's uh, added to the, to the minutes. Thanks. I can. Oh, even more. Yes, I um, just wanted to add that this is a good way to also double check that those issues are real, really uh, very important or high severity bugs because sometimes we have, I mean, even if changing the priority, it's only limited to a group of people, not like every user can do that. But sometimes you see uh, issues that has, uh, has been increased the severity and the priority, but then you see that, well, it's not realistic. So then you just adjust it. So it's, it's, it's also a way to, uh, for me and to double check that those are real uh, high issues or high risk issues. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, our real world meetings on Thursdays, they also nominally always run for one hour. And uh, what sometimes happens is that Heiko comes up with such a long list of UX issues that we take up the full hour and everybody's <laughs> falling asleep through half the hour. But what often also happens is that Heiko has a wonderfully prepared three item list of the most pressing UX issues. And uh, Miklos always steps in and says, yeah, that's something I know the fix for already. And uh, we're done with that part very quickly. And like a whoosh, go through the rest of the things as well. And then there's no new pressing bug of the week because we have introduced no new bugs. And we're done in like 15 minutes. And everybody closes their computers and goes back to whatever else they were happily doing. And uh, if there's no more questions today, then I'd suggest we also close our computers and uh, go back to coffee and whatever, the sunshine. Happy hacking. Happy hacking, everybody. Thank you for joining us.